Hello, our church family and friends. I am so thankful that you have joined us today. I'm talking about a topic today that blesses my heart, that I love to study, I love to preach on. I believe today is going to help you greatly, and I am glad you have joined us. We've been teaching a series called The Power of R. Today, I have called this uh, sermon The Power of Faith. Now, the power of our, we've talked about this, and you can turn with me to Hebrews chapter 11 in verse 8. But the power of our, we've been talking about this, our church is redemption, righteousness, relationship. Now, when we have a relationship with God, we partner with Him. It's like when we, when we commit our lives to our spouse, we take a vow to them, them to be faithful to them. And when we do that, there is a relationship that we have. We partnered with them. When we give our life to Jesus, we have a relationship with God and we partner with Him. Now, before we jump into things, uh, there was an article I read recently about um, Darwinism and some of his friends that were with him. And they came up with five things that we must have for creation of anything. And they said, one timing, two force, three actions, four space, and five matter. Now, the answer to all of this was written well before they came up with these five subjects. And I can read to you out of Genesis 1. It says, in the beginning, that is the time. Uh, God, that was the force, created, that is the action. The heavens, that is the space, and earth, that's the matter. Now this was written, like I said, well before they ever came up with these principles. And I like how science is catching up with what God has already done. But God is the force. He is the power. Now in your marriage, if there is no God applied into your marriage, then there is no power in your marriage to be able to change and to be what God has created you to do. Now God is the force. We have said he is the power and with you with me when we give our life to Jesus the power is strong with you all right <laughs> sorry I couldn't help for but to give you that little bit of reference here but when we decide that we are going to partner with what God is doing that is when the power is released now faith is how we partner with God faith is the vehicle that we get in side of to ride with God. If we're going to do anything for God and with God, we have to have faith. All right, now let's read here Hebrews 11 and 8. And we're going to stay in Hebrews 11 today. Hebrews 11 and 8 says, By faith, Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place which he should after receive for an inheritance, obeyed and he went out not knowing whither he went by faith so journeyed in the land of promise as in as in a strange country dwelled in the tabernacles with uh, Isaac and Jacob and the heirs with him of the same promise. Now Hebrews 11, I've already told you this, if you paid attention or stayed with us long enough, you know that Hebrews 11 is the hall of faith. Not the hall of fame, but the hall of faith. And faith has to be active. Faith is a verb. James tells us that faith without works is dead, is lifeless, is inactive, is unproductive. Faith that is not active is faith that does not help you at all. Faith is a verb. Faith is action. All right. So Hebrews 11, we're going to stay there. And faith, if it is not active, it will not help you. And I want to give you four verbs. We said faith is a verb. I want to give you four verbs that is going to help you understand faith that comes out of this chapter. Now, the first one I want to give you is obeying. Uh, oh, my goodness. 
Obedience is greater than sacrifice is what the Word tells us. If you're obedient to the Word of God, if you're obedient, He counts that greater than sacrificing anything. All right. Now, I have heard people say that faith is a blind leap. I would never describe faith as a blind leap. Uh, when God spoke to Sarah to, uh, and Abraham, they moved. They did something. They obeyed. But faith is seeing something spiritually before you ever see it in the natural. Faith is the best teacher. The world would tell us that experience is the best teacher. And I would argue that that is not true. Uh, experience is a cruel teacher, a harsh teacher. And I, I'll put it this way. Let's, let's go back uh, to Adam and Eve. Now, in, with Adam and Eve, God never expected them to um, e learn by experience. He wanted them to learn by faith. God spoke to them and said, Now, out of every fruit, out of every tree, you can eat of everything except this one. God told them, spoke to them, gave them direction, told them what to do. And experience was a cruel teacher to them. I'll give you another example of this. If you have children, when you tell them, hey, don't go play in the road, don't play in the street, would you rather them learn by faith what you said about playing in the street, or would you rather them learn by experience? Experience is cruel. Experience can be devastating. I'm not saying experience can't teach you anything. Experience can. But I would much rather hear from God and have it learn by faith than ever by experience. Oh, my goodness. Faith is when you hear God and move. My second verb I want to give you is the word dwelling. We said one, when we obey. That faith, one of the verbs of faith is obey. The second one is dwelling, which we see in verse 9. It says uh, that he dwelled in the land. And we already said this, he being Abraham and Sarah moved when God spoke, they made a commitment. They packed everything up and they moved. They left the land that they knew. They left the family that they knew. They left the friendships that they moved and they are they knew and they moved to where God told them. Can I tell you something? We have so many people in our church that we are not the closest church to them. Actually, I don't know of anyone that comes here and attends in person that states, Pastor, your church is the closest one to me, so we decided to go here. Most everybody that is in this place, everybody that attends our church, that is a member of our church, they know this is where God has called them. They made a commitment commitment to be a part of this church and they are here. Many are driving from long distances to get here, but they are faithful and have made a commitment. They have heard from God and they've made a commitment. So when we dwell in the place, we have to commit faith. We hear from God and we obey and we dwell in that place. We do what he has told us to do. Like this building. Okay. Our church, we moved very recently, November of 2000, and we moved in this location in the middle of a pandemic, in the absolute middle of a pandemic. And when God started to lead us this way, one, I knew it was going to take everything we had to buy this building. I knew it, we were in the middle of a pandemic. Finances were already down. People were not able to come. The city was already making um, mandates that people could not meet. They were shutting churches down. Uh, and all of a sudden, we're looking at buying a building. Can I tell you something? In the natural, it did not make sense at all. And not only was our finances down during the pandemic, I knew that buying this building was going to make our expenses go up. All of a sudden, we were going to have to buy things to be in this building. We were going to have to buy things to keep up this building. We were going to have to cut grass when we've never had to cut grass before. We were going to pay water, electric. We were going to have to pay for everything inside the building, which we 
we've rented and has been supplied for us. We knew that if the air condition goes out, that's us. If the heating goes out, that's us. Snow removal, we have to be responsible for it. And so in the natural pandemic, Churches are shutting down. Uh, the city has put on limits on churches. Um, the Dane County, our county has put limits on churches saying that they could not meet in person. And not even that, but they were even getting to a place where you couldn't have a camera guy, couldn't have somebody running sound, couldn't have you know all these people in the building together. Uh, and so all of a sudden, we feel that we've heard from God about buying a building, and it does not look easy. Not only does it not look easy, it's going to take everything we have and then some. It's going to take more time, more resources. But when, it, when we really felt this was what call, God has called us to do, and I would just like to put this out there for you, for those who feel that church, our church is their church, this is not our last and final location. I believe God has greater things in store for us. This is a stopping place to go on and do greater greater things for the Lord. This is not the end. This is just the beginning. God's blessings are just starting. But let's go back into it. All this stuff is going on. We felt we heard from the Lord. We prayed. And when I say we, I mean our church members, our deacons, our deaconess, all the church leadership got together, prayed, felt this was God, and we moved forward to do what God called us to do. We made a commitment to be faithful right here, even when circumstances didn't look like it was right for us to make the move at this time. We obeyed and we dwelt where he called us. We made a commitment to be here. Faith is when you hear God and move. But even in all of it, it was like, God, do you see everything that is happening? And it took faith to move right where we are. Faith is commitment when God speaks and leads. Faith is making a commitment when God speaks and leads. All right, so we said one is obeying, two is dwelling, and three is judging. Now, when I say judging, what does most Christians probably mind goes to? I know the world, most of them, if, if they know one scripture, uh, or at least one or two scriptures, they know this one. Don't judge. You know, even rap, rappers will have it, you know, across their t-shirt, don't judge. And the Bible does say, don't judge, at least you be judged. Now, what is that talking about? Does it mean we can't judge anything? Absolutely not. That's not what it's talking about. Now, when it comes to heaven and hell issues, we do not know the heart. Only God knows the heart. And He's the only one that can make that judgment. But in judgment, we are never meant to be critical and we are never meant to be condemning. We are meant to make righteous judgments. We have to make a judgment on what God is saying. Now let's look at Hebrews 11 and 11. It says here, Through faith also Sarah uh, herself received strength to conceive a seed and was delivered of a child when she was past age, underline this part, because she judged him faithful who had promised. Faith is judging God to be faithful. Now, if faith is judging God to be faithful, then doubt is judging God to be unfaithful. When we doubt God's word, we are making a judgment against God. But when we have faith, we are making a judgment for God. Now look, what am I saying here? Most people have this mentality that when you get saved, nothing else will be wrong. And sometimes it's taught in that manner. And yes, we will overcome. And yes, God will bless us. And God will supply all our needs according to His riches and glory. But you will have problems. You will have things pop up. Mountains in your way. Problems that come by enemy. Uh, some by our own, our own problems. Some things that we've done ourselves. But some things will come against us simply because we have made a decision to be committed to God and the enemy is trying to get us off course. Not everything, but some things that come our way is 100% from the enemy. 
But what I'm saying is that when we, we're, it's not that we're not going to have problems, but when we have them, we will judge God to be faithful, that He will bring us through. My last point here. We have said that uh, faith is obeying. Faith is dwelling or committing. Faith is judging. Judging God to be faithful. And my last point here, the last verb we see here is accounting. And we'll see that in 11, uh, Hebrews 11 and 17. Uh, and we'll read all the way through 19. By faith, when he was tried, offered up Isaac and had that had received the promise offered up his only begotten son. That scripture seems very familiar. Abraham here offering up his only begotten son. Now I'm going to prove to you in the next two scriptures that Abraham knew. He was convinced that God would raise up from the dead. Why? One, because God uh, told him the gospel. The Bible tells us that God shared the gospel with Abraham. There is only one gospel. That is that Jesus is the Son of God, that He would die for our sins, that He would pay the price, He would redeem us, He would make us righteous, and He would restore mankind's relationship with God Almighty. And it comes by the blood of Jesus. Abraham knew this before it ever happened. Abraham knew a Savior was coming. He knew the Son of God was coming and that he would be raised from the dead. He was in covenant with God and believed that God would do the same thing for him. Verse 18, Of whom it was said that, it, that in Isaac shall thou seed be called, accounting that God was able to raise him up even from the dead, from whence also he received him in figure. He knew that Abraham, Abraham knew that his blessing, the scripture was clear that Isaac would be his blessing, that his seed would increase on the face of the earth through Isaac. And all of a sudden God asked him, and I want to be very clear, this is the only time it has ever happened that God has ever asked any person, any father, any mother to offer their child. Only one time. It will never happen again. If you think, oh, I think God is telling me, you are wrong. Absolutely, without a shadow of a doubt, wrong. But in this, God had a relationship with Abraham. Told him about what his son was going to do. Abraham accounted. What does that mean? Uh, okay, well, when you are an accountant, when you look at your... Um, your account and you're trying to balance it, you look at all the checks that are out, you look at all the money that's in, you look at what the bank says, you look at what you say, you get in and you hit all those numbers on the calculator and at the end you are positive that this is the amount that you're supposed to have. And if you have to write a check, you know that check is good because you have counted all the numbers. Abraham looked and knew that God's word was true. God never lied to him. God never led him in a wrong manner. Abraham faced a lot of problems, but God always brought him through the problems. He has another problem that is before him that in the natural, everything looks wrong. In the natural, it doesn't look like it's going to work. So Abraham goes to work counting all the times that God was faithful. God has written a check to Abraham that looks too too big to cash. Have you ever got a check that looked too big and you were worried about cashing it? Um, <laughs> oh my goodness. And he counted. He added everything up and he knew that God was faithful that promised. And he took a step of faith. Even though the evidence didn't look, the natural didn't look like everything lined up, he counted God faithful. Yes, God wrote Abraham a check that looked too big to cash. But Abraham noticed that all the promises of God were in him, yes, and in him, amen. My friends, there was a time um, when we were trying to buy a home. Uh, me and my wife and Jesse was pregnant with our second child. And we had it time that we were going to move into our new home one month before her due date. I mean, Jesse was ready to have a baby. 
and you know, not to get into it 100%, but all of a sudden, the seller tried to back out. And it looked like I almost gave them permission to do so. I, what happened uh, was that I was looking, uh, we were trying to get a loan, and when we got uh, a, an approval, uh, they promised us no PMI if we had 20% down. We got the 20% down, and when we were trying to buy the building, when I went in, or the home, when I went in to look at the offer, there was PMI that was added, um, a lot more money. I think it was 20 something thousand dollars added to the loan that we were going to have to pay because of the PMI. And when I brought that to their attention, they said, sorry, it's too late. We have to move forward with this. And I said, you told me there would be no PMI. I can't do this. So I called the seller and asked, would you give me one more week? Would you move the, the date of the signing by one more week so I can get another bank really quick and get everything where it needs to be? And the seller said, yes. But there was a problem. They told me yes. And when we sent the paperwork, I walked out of the uh, office and told them, no way, I'm done, no PMI. I'm going to another bank. But when I told uh, the seller that, and the seller said, yep, they would give me an extra week. When I sent the paperwork over for them to sign, they never signed it. And even though I had their word, and I believed them, what was written in the contract held stronger than their verbal consent. So all of a sudden, it looks like we're going to lose our, our, our home. Looks like we're going to lose the home. Now, Jesse is pregnant. And Jesse is very concerned that we're not going to have a place to live. Our apartment that we were living in at the time already found people to take our place. And we asked the apartment, do you have another apartment that we can just stay in until uh, we can get things taken care of? And they're like, no, we're book solid. Everywhere we called was book solid. We tried to call, um, there's some, I think they call it CEO housing for people that are traveling and maybe in a city a month to two months to three months. You're able to buy these apartments month by month and they're fully furnished. And I just thought, we'll keep all our stuff packed and we'll move in. There's four, four of these. CEO housing complexes available in my city. I called all four. All four had no space, no place available. And Jesse was getting frustrated and we had no answers. And we're getting closer and closer to having to get out. Now our realtor knows what's happened. They're starting to look for other things and uh, it, was, it was a devastating time. And Jesse saying, are where are we going to have this baby? Are we going to have this baby in a motel? Are we going to have this baby in a motel? Now, I made a joke, and I would just recommend, guys, if you're ever in this, don't make a joke at uh, a time where they are really concerned and less than a month away from their due date. And I told Jesse, I said, no, we're not going to have this baby in a hotel. We'll have the baby in a hospital. We may just be living in a hotel. I thought it was funny. Jesse did not find this funny at all. So you might even say, what is the point of this story? I went for a walk. I was devastated. I didn't know what to do. And I was even praying, Father, I thought when we prayed that I was being led by your spirit and that this house was for us. I thought this was your promise. I thought this was for us. And now all of a sudden, it, we're not going to get it. Now all of a sudden, we've been done wrong. We've been lied to. And we're in a bad place. And Jesse is about to give birth, and I have no place to live. And I went for a walk, and I was praying. And I, I still remember it like it was yesterday. I know I could take you to the exact location I was. And I'm praying. And I remember telling the Lord, I have no idea. No idea what's going to happen. But I trust you, Lord. I trust you. Even if I missed it. Maybe I missed it. Maybe this house isn't for us. Maybe you're saving me from something. I have no idea. If I missed it, I'm sorry. Forgive me. Help me, Father. 
help us find a place in time. I'm going to tell you, that moment was a pivotal moment for me. Coming to the conclusion to tell God, I have no idea what's happening, but I trust you. I trust you. One Sunday morning, as I'm sitting out in our a room close and has a good view of the outside, I'm sitting there and I'm preparing for Sunday sermon. And it's early Sunday morning. Sun is rising. All of a sudden, my phone rings. And it's my realtor. Now, my realtor knows I'm a preacher, knows I prepare Sundays, knows that you know I have a lot to do on Sunday. So I decided I better answer this. So I answered the phone and my realtor said, Tim, I hate that all this happened. And your only fault, the only thing you did wrong was trust the seller. You trusted him. You believed his word. That is the only thing that was wrong. And she said, I would like to do something if you would allow me. She said, I would like to buy the house. She said, I'm a believer. I'm a realtor and God has blessed me. My husband, he builds homes and God has blessed him. We have the cash. We would like to buy it. And then we would like to sell it to you. And she said, due to anti-flipping laws, I can't sell it to you right after. I have to wait a month. But she said, I want you to have that house. And I asked her, I said, is this normal? And she goes, no, it's not. And I go, well, um, what happens is something else. I would have never predicted that we would have had this problem with PMI. I would have never predicted. What if something else happens? What if something else happens that I can't predict and I can't buy this house from you? She goes, well, then I own a home I don't want and I'll have to look another way to sell it. And I said, you're willing to do that for us? And she goes, yeah, I'm willing to do it for you. I'm going to tell you something, my friend. I could go on in more questions and more conversations I had with her. But to make it shorter, I've already made it a long story, but make it short. We got the home. Our second daughter was born and we were able to walk right into our house. <laughs> uh, it was tight. It was rough. There was problems, mountains in our way, problems in our way. But God was faithful. Why did I tell you that story? It changed my life when I got to the point where I said, Father, I had no idea what's happening. All I know is that I trust you. I looked at everything. And I knew what the natural was all the way around me. But I came to a point where I said, God, I'm accounting that you are faithful. I'm going to be obedient to follow you. I'm going to make a commitment. I'm going to dwell wherever you tell me to dwell. And I judge you to be faithful. My friend, when you do all those things, you are walking in faith. Now, I want to tell you this. The Bible tells us that when we accept Jesus as our Savior, we're saved. When we confess Him with our mouth and believe in our heart that Jesus is the Son of God, not just a great prophet, which He was, not just a good man, which He was, but He was the Son of God. When we believe that and confess that with our mouth, we are saved. If you have never done that, I want today to be your day. I want today to be the day you confess Jesus, that you turn into a son of God, that you get out of darkness and come into the light. I want this to be the day that your life changes forever. Maybe you say you have did that before, that you confess Jesus as your Savior, but you walked away like the prodigal son. The beauty about the prodigal son is the story never ends there. The son came to his senses and he came home. 
he came home. My friend, today is your day to come home. When you come home, the Father is waiting. He's looking. He's desiring that you come back. You know, in the first two sermons we preached in this series, we said that God decided to need man and that God wanted you. God still wants you in His kingdom. God desires for you to make this decision. Let's say this prayer. If you believe in your heart, you're ready to confess with your mouth, let's do this together. I want you to say this prayer after me. Dear Heavenly Father, we confess that Jesus is the Son of God. We believe in our heart. We have confessed. We believe Your Word. We have counted You to be faithful, to be true. So we know today that we are saved. Not might be, but we are. Today, we are children of God. In Jesus' name, amen. My friends, if you've said that for the first time, or if you've come home to be with God like the prodigal son did, get a hold of us. Let me know. Thank you so much for joining us today. I hope this message blessed you. I know it blessed me just studying for it. Uh, we will see you in person at our church. We are a non-denominational church here in Madison, Wisconsin. And we would love for you to make our church your church. But if you're too far away, if we can't see you in person, we will see you online. God bless you. We'll see you next week.